All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Glad you're right here on the very front row. I'll probably point at you about 50 times today. Good. Let me give you just a quick little story. You know, I, I got to tell you that I've only been involved in the WordPress community for a few months. And um, I'm an, an older guy. I'm looking around, probably one of the older guys in the room. And so my background, I used to come through Dayton before I-75 was built. So that tells you kind of how old I am. But, uh, you know, I used to tell everybody, because when I was in college, we didn't have computers. So I couldn't learn code and do all that because we didn't have any computers to do that. So I'd always say to people, we didn't have computers when I was in college. Well, in 2003, I became a grandfather. And my grandson, smart little guy, came up a little bit. And in 2011, I had my fourth grandchild. And my granddaughter, when she was two years old, was sitting on the floor playing with the iPad. And my grandson, who at that time was uh, eight, leaned over to my wife and said, you know what, Grandma? When I was her age, we didn't have iPads. So I thought, no, mm, that's pretty interesting. So that's kind of the way I was. So I got involved with the WordPress community, and I, I got to meeting people that were all business people. They were doing WordPress for various and sundry reasons. They were doing uh, coding. They were doing it independently. And so I thought, you know, with my background, there may be something that I have to offer to this community because I certainly can't offer coding advice. I can't offer any computer advice, but I can offer some tax advice. So my background is in the tax industry. I've been around for a while. And uh, so I just wanted to share some things so that you all if, uh, may be helpful to you. But Benjamin Franklin said it in, in uh, the 1700s. There's only two certainties in life, death and taxes. And then uh, Dennis Waitley came along in the middle 80s, and he said, you know, there's another certainty in life, and that is change. So when you put taxes and change together, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on. So uh, we're not going to talk about death today. We're going to talk about taxes and change and changes in the tax law and how you can take advantage of them either as an individual or as a business. Is anybody apprehensive about the IRS? Everybody nervous about the IRS? You know, you hear all these stories about the IRS and how, you know, kind of uh, they, they'll come and do all kinds of things to you. But the IRS was established or founded in uh, 1862 and then in 1953, the name was changed to the IRS, Internal Revenue Service. And they are responsible for collecting the taxes, okay? Now, they're, they, don't, they don't do the tax code. They are responsible for upholding and enforcing the tax code. Now, the tax code is created by Congress. So the Internal Revenue Code is created by Congress and it is 74,000 pages long. So when you do your income tax return, whether it's for your business, whether it's for your personal, all of the laws and all of the rules for 74,000 pages become a part of that. Well, last year in December, we had the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And it was signed on December 22nd, 1917, or uh, 1917. Shows you how old I am, still thinking the 1900s. But uh, it was signed into law <clears throat> on that. And it was the biggest overhaul in a generation. They haven't had as many sweeping changes in the tax law in 30 years. So this was a big deal. And it's impacted everybody. And I'm sure you've read about it, you've heard about it. Uh, in the news, you've heard about it uh, online. Every day there seems to be some kind of a story. And now 
We're right in the middle of tax season. How many of you done your taxes this year? A few of you. Did you get more back or less back? A little less. A little less. What about y'all? More or less back? The, the, the papers say that early on in the season, the people are getting less back, and but now they say they're getting more back. So it, 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 uh, one thing that we'll say and when we get into Q&A, the answer is, well, it all depends. It depends on your situation. It depends on where, where you are. So the, the IRS was responsible for taking the laws and in a short amount of time, putting them into documents so that they could be executed this year. So, and with, and with the government shutdown, we're, we're a little bit behind, or they're a little bit behind. So, here we are. It's time for us to do our taxes. And uh, this is a cute little, little uh, joke here. So, when you are a WordPress community, and you work on... Uh, programming or if you do websites for people one thing that you have to determine is whether you are a business or a hobby you know a lot of people they get involved with uh, programming they get involved in doing uh, websites for people and they do one here and one there and they don't do it on a regular basis and they might not claim any uh, deductions for any of that so you know they might be doing it for a hobby well on this new tax law a lot of changes happen and a couple of them were this you can no longer claim deductions for business losses on your schedule a used to you could claim that so anybody that itemizes deductions this year cannot claim any kind of business at all in addition you cannot claim any expenses for a hobby. You could before, but in the, in the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, they cut out all expenses for a hobby. And I'll give you an example of that. If somebody were a painter and they painted, uh, and not houses, but they painted pictures and they sold the pictures and they made $3,000 for selling their paintings uh, you to, to people around the country and it cost them a thousand dollars to pay for the paints and to travel to you know uh, fairs and that kind of thing they have to claim three thousand dollars in income and zero expenses so if you're in that situation that you're doing WordPress and and you have uh, you know some expenses and you're doing some uh, work, you need to then decide, do I want this to be my business so I can lower my taxable income, or do I want it to remain a hobby? And if you want it to be a business, you have to make noise. And what that means is, you have to, you have, to have se records. You set up a sec separate bank account so that you can have... Um, you know, all of your income separate. You write your checks out of a separate uh, bank account. And you can then start uh, continuing education. A trip like this is continuing education, getting you, uh, you know, more knowledgeable about what you're about as far as your uh, business is concerned. So you have to make that determination. And if you want to... Uh, take advantage of the tax laws and take advantage of the uh, allowable deductions, which we're going to talk about in a minute, then you need to make the noise and you can set it up as a business. So in setting it up as a business, we need to understand the business structure, okay? And so whenever I talk to you, I want to talk to what the majority of you may be uh, involved with, and, and that is a sole proprietorship. So a sole proprietorship, sole means one. And so you have to be the only person involved in the business as far as the management of the business. Now, if a husband and a wife work together and they do things together in the business, then it's not a sole proprietorship. If the husband makes decisions 
for the wife or the wife makes decisions for the husband. It's not a sole proprietorship. It is a partnership then. And there are set, uh, uh, different tax laws and tax rules. So most of you that do work and that do uh, programming and, and don't work for a company, you're a sole proprietor. Now you can work for a company and still work on the side and still be a sole proprietor. Sole proprietor is not really a legal entity, okay? So if I go out and sell Mary Kay, I'm not very good at that, by the way. Uh, if I go out and sell Mary Kay and they pay me because I collect money and I, and I turn the money in and I get expenses, then I'm a sole proprietor and I'm not a legal entity, then I take the income and, and put it on a Schedule C of my tax return, okay? Income, expenses is a Schedule C. So it's just what I do, okay? A partnership would do the same thing. But if I sold Mary Kay and I did something so that somebody was hurt or injured by the product that I sold, as a sole proprietor, if I were sued, then they could come after me, my house, my car, my furniture, and I would be in big trouble as a sole proprietor. But there's another entity called a uh, limited liability corporation that you can be a sole proprietor and establish a limited liability corporation. You can do that as a sole proprietor. You can do that as a partnership. And, and so when it says limited liability, I want to kind of clarify for you that it's not full liability. Because if you have to use your personal assets to start the business, then they could attach uh, any legal legality to your personal assets. So uh, you, you have to get this set up properly and hopefully get your business going so that you can start getting loans in the name of the business. And, and, it, would pro and it could still have your name attached to it. It could be, what's your name? Shannon. It could be Shannon's uh, programming company, LLC. But the LLC is the liability, the limited liability that Shannon has in order to uh, protect herself in, in that company. But here's the interesting part. An LLC is what they call a pass-through entity. So if you're a sole proprietor, I'm, I'm selling Mary Kay, I'm not an LLC, I fill out a Schedule C on my tax return, and, and I just do, do my tax return, and I can lower my liability. As a limited liability company LLC, the taxes do not go to Shannon's LLC. They go on to Shannon's personal tax return. So it's a pass-through. It, there's a pass-through for partnerships. It passes through the partnership. If you make a $1,000 profit and you have two partners, one partner gets a $500 uh, income and the other partner gets a $500 income. If you have five partners, it's equally divided or it's divided according to the percentage of partnership that you might own in the business. So it passes right through to your personal. Now, if you're a corporation, then you have, it's a, that's a separate entity. It's a separate legal entity. So you could be Shannon's uh, software company, Inc. You could be incorporated. Then the corporation pays taxes, and you don't, unless the corporation pays you, and then you pay taxes only on the amount that you're paid by the corporation. The corporation is taxed. And sometimes, you know, people, they, they don't want to get into a corporation because they feel like they're being taxed 
twice, and that could happen because your corporation gets taxed, and then you get taxed, but the taxes are a, a lot lower, okay? Then the, the, the other pass-through part is, well, it's not a pass-through, but the other kind of catch is you can be a sole proprietor, LLC, and select to be taxed as a corporation so that then you can pay yourself a salary. So if you're an LLC and you're a sole proprietor, you can't pay yourself a salary. You can have an owner's draw, so you can take money out of the corporation, but at the end of the year, when you do your Schedule C and you do your income tax return, the profit is taxable and you have to pay self-employment tax on that. So you pay tax on the, uh, on, the, on the profit of that business minus all your deductions. So there's, a, there's an opportunity there. And, and my company is an example. I'm an LLC. But I selected to be a corporation because I have different entities. And so I have to pay a, I file what they call an 1120 tax return. And... The corporation is taxed, and if I pay myself, then I have to either pay uh, self-employment tax or I pay myself as a W-2 employee. I can do that as a corporation, but I can't as a partnership or a sole proprietorship if I'm, if I'm one of the owners. I have to get a K-1 or something like that. So anyway, so there's all of these are interesting Ways that it's part of that uh, 47 or 74,000 page document that all of this is is marked up in, and then you have an S corporation where you can be uh, have partners be taxed as a pass through. You divide up the the uh, the profits again, and that passes through to your personal income tax. So. But you file a different tax return. You, you file an 1120S, and it's sometimes called a sub, subchapter S corporation. So that's, that's kind of the business structure. Now, when you have a business, the, the IRS allows you deductions. And they have to be necessary and ordinary. Okay? So what that means is if you have... A deduction that is necessary for your business, then you can claim it. But if it's ordinary then, and something that you, you know, is common to the business, I mean, if you have a business and you have to give people documents and print them out, then the paper that you buy, is, that's necessary, okay? And to be necessary, it doesn't have to be, by golly, this is it, but it can be um, you know, things that you, you need. Like, I need a clicker if I'm going to click on a slideshow, okay? So I'm clicking, and I buy this clicker. It's necessary, but it's not mandatory necessary. So there are things that you can claim that, you, that are necessary but this isn't necessary ordinary if I don't do presentations or if people that are in my line of work don't do presentations. So that's just a, 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 excuse me, a small example of that. Uh, ordinary is things like coming to a conference or, or mileage. So uh, what I want to do is just tell you about some of these deductions that are, that, uh, are most common. There are over 100 deductions that are allowable to you. And a lot of you may claim every single one of them, but there, there are 100 deductions. But the ones that are most common are right here on this, on this uh, slide. And I've highlighted the yellow because I wanted to speak to them uh, and, and just address them for just a moment. Education and training. So if you're, if you're coming here as a hobby and you drove here from Michigan and it was 
200 miles, and this is your hobby, and you paid $40 to get here, and, and you went out to dinner last night, and you had a nice glass of wine, and you had a, you know, a $52 steak. If this is your hobby, forget it. You can't claim any of it at all. But if this is your business, then you can claim 58 cents a mile to drive here the 200 miles. You can claim your meal, but the the rules for meals are a little bit different. You can only claim 50% of your meal. Okay, so you got a little math to do when you do your income tax return. You can claim your hotel room, and you can claim uh, the, the uh, $40 that you paid to, to come in here. So that's, a, that's all a tax deduction. So if this year you made, or if you got some business while you were here and you, you, you made $400, but your mileage and everything added up to $300, then you only made 100 bucks according to the IRS and the, and the law, okay? Equipment. You all work in co- uh, computers. Just about everybody here has a computer in front of them, and you can claim the computer. Now, in the past, you had to depreciate the computer, and you could only claim a portion of it each year. But with the new tax law and the uh, deduction that's called Section 179, I think is the is the number on it. You can claim the entire computer, and you don't even have to list it on as as inventory. You know, you might want to, in case you sell your company, but uh, you can claim the whole in, entire computer effective on the tw- this 22nd of December last year. So, if you bought a compu- computer last year, you can claim the whole thing. So, the equipment, and interestingly enough. You can claim, if you want to buy a car for your business, 100% now. Yes? I have a question about like services, like internet and cell phone service. How do you determine what percentage should be allocated for your business if you have it at home? You know, what phone goes with you, but at home you have the internet. That's a great question, and I'll get to that in another slide. I've got you covered, okay? Meals, we already talked about meals, but you can claim 50%. But here's the interesting thing about meals. Meals, you eat all the time. And the rule that's allowable is you have to talk about business before the meal or during the meal or after the meal. Okay? So I go to Chick-fil-A, and I take my wife with me, and we talk about business. I claim that deduction because we talked about business. Or we may be sitting talking about business because she's part of my company. We may be talking about business and then say, hey, let's go get something to eat. We go get something to eat immediately, and we can claim that meal. We can only claim 50% of it, but guess what? If she eats a meal and I eat a meal, we get to claim one of them, and that's good news, okay? At the end of the year, those add up. Yes. She's a, she, yeah, you can. She, but she's, she's an employee. She's a partner in my business. Right. 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 She's not claimed because she's my spouse. But I talk about business with everybody. And everybody's a potential client. (laughs) Everybody I talk to, even all of you, are potential clients. Yes? Uh, Roughly, uh, uh, how long before or after she talked about this? Well... Typically, you, 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 has anybody ever watched The Mad Men? 
Yeah, anyway, if you didn't, you, you need to go Google it and then watch it on Netflix or something. It's a great show. But, you know, they're always going out and eating and talking about business. But it needs to be relatively, you know, soon. Yeah, you can't go eat lunch and then about 8 tonight say, mm, oh, let's talk business. But I, it, it needs to be a reasonable, and typically it's during the meal. Okay, but before, after, or you can grab a meal like we've done here. We just grabbed a meal downstairs and went up to a to a a, a, a podcast, a live podcast. Now, if we were paying for that meal and went up, then it, it it's immediately after. Yes. Yeah. You're you're. Did you stay in a hotel? Okay. You're that's a you're you're on a business trip. So you can claim that whole that whole thing. Well, you, 50%. But you you keep your receipt, keep claim 50%. Just like her, you're way ahead of me. I'll get to that. I'll answer that question in just a minute. You guys are awesome. You're way ahead of me. Travel. That's what I really want to talk about, too. So if you, if I send you a check, because you did my website, I send you a check, and you take that check and deposit it in the bank. The bank is five miles from your house. That's five miles to the bank and five miles back. You can claim 58 cents a mile because that's a part of your business operation. That's ordinary part of business. You have to deposit that check. Well, no, you don't since it's coming from me, but you need to deposit that check, okay? So that's part of the ordinary business expense. So the mileage, that can add up if you go to a business lunch. and you. But it depends on kind of where you live and where your business is. You can't claim, if you work for someone, you can't claim going to and from work, okay? You can't claim that kind of thing. And so they've got rules, and, and, and it's allowable. You just have to play within the rules, okay? And then the last is wages. How many have kids that are teenage, 8 and 9, 10 years old? Okay. If you have a child, that, and you have a company, and your child, if you put them to work and pay them, now, it has to be legitimate. You can't be a three-year-old and you're paying them because you need the deduction. But if they're 10 and they can make copies, they can scan, they can, they can do whatever assignment that you can give them, you can pay them. And you don't have to pay Medicare and, uh, and Social Security on them so you don't have to deduct it. Claim it on your Schedule C as wages, and, you, and that brings your taxable income down. And what I like to do is see how much I'm supposed to pay, get all my deductions in there, and then see how much I pay, and then it's like, yes. But, but unfortunately, all my kids are over 18. Uh, unfortunately, all my kids are over 40. But... Uh, but you can, and they can only be 18, okay? You can't claim them after 18, so they've got to be in those teenage years. So, a child. A child. Okay. And you decide you want, let's say, my niece. No. Child. Child. Your child. You can't do your niece. You can't do my grand. Hey, trust me. I got four grandkids. If I could go beyond my children, whew, I wouldn't be paying any taxes. It's got to be reasonable. You can't give them $100,000 a right. year. Let's say $50 a year. Okay, for a right. Yeah.
What the child does with it is no concern of the IRS. What you do with it in, on behalf of the child is no concern of the IRS, okay? So you can put it in a, uh, a cruise account and go on a cruise and pay for the child's cruise out of that if they gotta make you know, more than $50, so, okay? Uh, so it, it's a sole proprietorship or a partnership. C Corp, different rules, different, you know, you could pay uh, 1099, you could pay them a 1099, but if they were your child. Or you could actually pay somebody, say you had a kid uh, that um, mowed the lawn or something, that, and it was a legitimate, it's got to be legitimate. You can't just start making stuff up but it's got to be a legitimate task, then, and they made over $600, then you'd have to give them a 1099. If they made under $600, you wouldn't. You could still pay them, and it's an expense. Oh, you're a C Corp, okay. All right. So this is one that you all are going to be uh, thinking about, because if you're all in business for yourself, this allowable home deduction. So let me just say this about um, the IRS. I'm going to talk to you about a tax gap in just a minute. But a lot of people want to claim their office, and that's an allowable deduction if you do work from home. However, when you start looking at uh, the number of tax returns that were done last year, 150 million tax returns were done, and you start looking at audits, and you all said, yeah, I'm scared of the IRS, the percentage of audits to individuals and, and, and companies or individuals is very, 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 very low. And I believe that with the, the uh, government shutdown, the IRS said they were a year behind. I'm not sure how they got a year behind, only being shut down a couple weeks, but that's what they said. So the chances are slim for me as an individual to get audited if, you know, I got things in, in place, okay? C-Corps, it, it raises, not C-Corps, but a, a sole proprietor, a Schedule C on your tax return, it, it kind of raises that opportunity for an audit. If you claim your home as a deduction, it puts a flag, a red flag, or a yellow flag. It depends on the, the, how much you claim. But that higher, it raises your, um, you know, the opportunity for you to get an audit. So they're pretty, pretty uh, you know, pretty snotty nose about this home deduction. And, and so it's written up there what, they'll, what they're looking at is it's got to be your principal place of business, okay? And it's got to be on a regular basis. So you can't just say, oh, yeah, I did one uh, website, and so I'm going to just claim my home as a deduction. So, but when you claim your home, you have to claim the square footage of the space, and you can claim mortgage, you can claim electric. So you can get your deduction, you know, up there pretty good. However, it has to be used exclusively for that business. So that means, and the IRS will ask, did you check your email, your personal email in your office? Now, if you go off to an office somewhere and work for the man, you can check your email all day long. You can take your child to the office with you if your boss will let you, and it's no big deal. But you can't do it in your home office. You're not supposed to check your email now. People do it, but if, if the IRS audits you and asks you that question and you say yes, disallowed. Can't take the deduction. I heard a story of an IRS guy coming into somebody, their home office was right there, they had all their stuff, and the IRS guy came in and said, uh, what's, the, what's the baby uh, cradle uh, crib doing in here? And she says, oh watch my, my little girl, you know, while I'm working. Disallowed. 
it's not exclusive. So they really, like I say, that, that raises a, a red flag. But there's an opportunity then for you to take a more simple option. So you can take $5 per square foot maximum of 300 square feet. So you have to take you know, the amount of space that you have and and then you can, but it's a maximum of a, of a $1,500 deduction. So if you need a deduction, that's the best way to go it, unless you are, by golly, sure that you're not going to have to worry about that audit and worry about the, uh, you know, the penalties for that, okay? So the, here's why the IRS, they, you know, they're tasked with, with actually keeping these, uh, they're tasked with raising money. They're tasked with collecting the money. And this is why they sometimes get so snotty-nosed. There is a tax gap. And the tax gap is the amount between what people say their income is. So I'm a, I'm a, a, a server at a restaurant, and I made like $700 in tips. And I do my tax return, but I only claim 300. So the amount that you're supposed to claim versus the amount that you claim. So there's a, a 400, 54 billion dollar gap, and it's the IRS's job to try to close that gap. Now, 122 billion of that is from Schedule C companies. That's why. Uh, they, they take a close look at that because the opportunity for them to get more money back in fines and penalties is greater, okay? So, and then a lot of people don't even file their taxes. So, go figure. So here's the answer to your question. You have to keep good records, okay? Uh, you have to have documents. You have to have... Uh, backup for everything that you claim. Now, I've had clients come in with a box full of receipts. And it's like, so you say, well, if you want to go over there and separate those receipts, then we'll talk. Or you can pay me $100 an hour, and I'm happy to separate them. You know, Well, how long is that going to take you? Oh, about $2,000 worth. So they save $2,000 by separating the receipts after they bring them in, but the reality is they should do it beforehand. So you came to Dayton, you keep a mileage log of your miles, and then you keep a receipt, you make yourself out an expense report, you have a good record of that. You, you stapled your meal uh, receipt to your hotel bill and then keep it in a file and say, this was my trip to Dayton to WordCamp for the uh, education slash training expense that I'm taking on my tax return, okay? So it's perfectly okay to jot down your own notes when you're not receiving it. Yeah, it's perfectly okay to jot down your own notes when you're not receiving it. Right. Um, and the way that I used to do it, I guess, is I gave them out, but now I get bundles of two hundred dollars. Right. That's set aside. If if that were is a regular course of business or a marketing function, you just have to document it that way and say this is part of my advertising campaign to do whatever it is or whatever the reason is, so that you can have some kind of substantiation of that. Okay. And and and. That's a tough one because then the that's up to uh, that's one of those it depends answers because it depends on who you get to audit you if you were to get audited. If you don't get audited, it's no big deal, you know. But you have to be ready that you're one of that smaller percentage of people that get audited. Okay, so you have to have canceled checks. You have to have receipts. Yes. Correct. But the IRS guy may say, prove it. Okay? 
So anyway, but you would, that's, that's one of those things that you, if that's what you do and you can take pictures of giving them out or have, you know, some kind of a record. Okay, and we're running out of time. So anyways, here's the thing. Record keeping is critical. You got to keep good records. And I keep records of records. Okay, I got records of everything. I got, you know, I go on a trip, I come back with a pocket full of receipts. I fill out an expense report every month that says, here's where I went, here, here's what I did, here's the mileage. You used to have to keep the, the, um, the mileage. You used to have to say 942,000 miles to 947,000 miles and subtract. But now with all these apps and, and uh, all that stuff, you can just calculate. But you have to keep a good record of that. So, uh, and keep track of those any expenses you deduct and good record keeping also then helps you when you do your tax return, okay? Instead of bringing in a box of receipts, you bring in a nice little folder with everything, doot, 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 and then the tax guy loves you. Here's another uh, 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 deduction that you get this year. <coughs> it's called the Qualified Business Income. Brand spanking new, and they've got a lot of rules attached to it. But in a nutshell, if you make... A thousand dollars on a qualified income for your business, you can take 20% right off the top, right off your taxable in income. So it's a qualified business income. Uh, you have to make under, then I'm sure most of you make over 315,000. So maybe you can't claim it, but you got to make under 315,000 uh, joint and under 157,000 whether you file a uh, joint uh, or whether you file uh, as a sole proprietor or not, or file as a married filing separately or as a single filer. These are the tax rate changes. Uh, there's four different kinds of categories that you're going to fall in. You're going to fall in as a single. You're going to file fall in a married filing jointly. You're going to fall into a married filing separately or a head of household. So if you're head of household, you have to uh, be single or separated or divorced, and you have to have a dependent, okay? So you get a little higher deduction for that. These are for last year. 2019 is gonna change. So these are kinda, you can look here real quick and see what your tax bracket is. Um, married filing jointly is a little bit different. Married filing separately is a little bit different, and then head of household is higher. And uh, so anyway, I started this presentation telling you that I was not a uh, computer guy. Remember that part? So let me just say this to you. I'm happy to send you these slides, but I've got to email them to you because I don't know how to do it on uh, on. Uh, anything i i actually have a i actually have a twitter account and the only thing i know about twitter and this is a segue to your next guy is i get these notifications in my email and it says nathan ingram has posted on twitter i get them all the time almost every single day and i go delete <laughs> so i'm gonna well, but so President Trump is on there, too. It's you and President Trump. Whoever uh, is on Twitter gives me these notifications. But Nathan's always the, you, you're always the top one, Nathan. Always the top one. So anyway, just take a picture of that. Send me an email. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to email me. And, um, or you can send me a Twitter post. I'll never respond, but you can still send me one. Okay. Any last questions before our time is up? Yes, a short one. So let's say I'm doing that about two years But let's say I can use my business card You you might slide by and, and let me give you two examples of that. One, I'm gonna use you again. He goes to the hotel, okay? And he and he goes to he gets room service and and he gets a massage, and he gets, you know, 
but his total bill for the hotel <clears throat> for the stay is $113 or $150. Depends on where he stays. But the bill is $342. So he just turns in the receipt for the hotel. Well, if he were to get audited and claim that $340, the IRS is going to want a breakdown. They're going to want a receipt for the room service, or they're going to want some kind of tracking of that because it comes out of different categories. You're going to pay <clears throat> for lodging, you're going to pay $150. For the meal, you're going to pay $65, which you can only claim half of. So they're going to want a breakdown rather than the whole thing. You got a credit card account and you go to uh, Walmart. Well, they want to know what at Walmart you bought. Did you buy notebooks or did you buy candy or did you buy, you know, uh, water? Well, you can use the water in your business. So you could claim the water. I claim coffee. I drink coffee all the time. So if I get coffee, you know, things of coffee, I'll claim the coffee, okay? But then I'll get one thing of coffee that's for me because it's mine, right? So, but there, you got to, you got to kind of separate them out because that record keeping is important. I always say this, you know, there's a lot of people and there's a lot of gray area and you got to let your conscience be your guide and you know do what's right and that's why they call them allowable deductions the, the irs doesn't care if you claim meals they don't care if you claim coffee they don't care if you claim mileage they just want it to be right and they want you to do it right and if you don't they're going to penalize you they're going to disallow the deduction and when people get audited, they're really afraid. But the reality is, if you can go into an audit with documentation, substantiation, which just means prove it, and you can go in and prove it, they'll say, okay, thanks, and off you go. As a matter of fact, the first business I ever started, I got audited, and I'm going, oh, my God. And, and there was a basis, and I hadn't claimed any basis. I went into the audit scared to death and got $10,000 out of my And I said, hey, you can audit me every year. <laughs> yes. They, it, it, again, it depends. It depends on who your agent is if you get audited. If you don't get audited, it's good enough. You know? That, I mean, because it's legitimate. It's just like with her two, $2 giveaway. It's a legitimate expense, and, but it's hard to prove, you know? So she gives away $100 and two, you know, she gives away actually $52 bills, but she claims that she gave five hundred two dollar bills so she can get a bigger deduction that's where the irs says mm, we got to substantiate that but if you can say and look at the calendar there was a wordpress in phoenix and i was there and so here's the receipt of my i know i saw it i said here's the receipt from that trip i was there i was on the speaker here's a picture of me at, on the program then that's, you, you got yourself covered. You have an argument. You have a position to argue. Okay? Thank you for your, oh, yeah, yeah. Scan receipts are perfect, yeah. And there's apps right now that you can just take a picture of it and all like that. That's, that's perfectly fine. You just have to have that documentation. Thank you. <laughs>